Father, today as we come to the holy word of Jesus, may we understand you in a remarkable new way. Teach us from your word now. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last Sunday we began a new sermon series entitled Unexpected. Because we have a God that as soon as we start to put in a box and figure out everything, he is remarkable. New depths of teaching to bring to us in new ways, unexpected ways, to challenge us and to move us forward. We're kind of in a, a theme verse in this sermon series out of Ephesians chapter 2, and the words on the screen behind me. Now all... Glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. In other words, we have a God who is able to do more than our imaginations can even come up with. We have a God who is surprising at many times. And often as we go through the scriptures, we come to what seem to be simple messages. And yet, when we look at them, they profoundly take us to new places beyond our comprehension. They point us to a God who is beyond. A God who is bigger than we can possibly imagine. This morning, we're going we're gonna to come to a a short book of the Old Testament called Hosea. A minor prophet. He's the first one of the minor prophets in the, in the Old Testament. He's the longest of them. And it's a book that is written to the people of Israel. Uh, it was at a time where the people of God were divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. This is meant to be read by the the northern kingdom, but it's meant to be overheard by the southern kingdom. And I bring all that up because it's important for us to note this is a message that God has given to his people. This is not, not just something that's to be read by people, but he gives a message to the church that is quite remarkable, that shows the love of God, particularly brought to us through his forgiveness. Last week, we started this sermon series. I, I, I took us to uh, the book of Jeremiah, in which the people of God have, have failed. They, they think. They claim. They, they, they have this image in their minds that they've got everything all together, that they are good God that they are, they're, they're doing all things that God wants, and yet, and yet God brings down some pretty harsh judgment. But, within this harsh judgment, this statement, you know what? I'm going to call you back. I'm going to be bringing you back to my glory. They, they think they've done everything right, and yet they are serving God half-heartedly at best. And as a result, the nations around them, why, why should they listen to the message of God? If the people of God aren't even following it right. Today we're going to stay in this world of the prophets. We're going to come to the people. At a moment when they are good and pure, in their own minds. And yet God comes along and he needs to intervene to bring their lives to fully understand, to fully live in the joy, the glory of the forgiveness of God, to truly bask in all hope and goodness that God has for them. And within what is really a proclamation of doom, we discover we can move past our own concerns. 
We can move past the things that just fill our vision, distract us from the things of God, so that we can remarkably sit in the fullness of God's grace once again. We need to discover all the depths of God's forgiveness so we can have a relationship with Him. We need, once again, and you know what? This is true for all of us every moment of the day. It's so easy to come to church and how we put it all before. It's so easy to come here and people want to say about the message again. But you know what? We are called every day, every moment, to be overwhelmed by the glory of God. We're going to come to Hosea. We're going to focus on the first few chapters, but we're going to quickly kind of scan the whole 14 chapter book today. And so hang on. It'll be okay. We're going to start the story of an unexpected marriage. In fact, we're going to come to a story that is so strange in the Bible. As you, as you look at what different scholars have said in this book, they often write, ah, oh, this has got to be a parable. It's got to be just some story that they made up that's not a true story. It's not written that way, though. It's almost written like a real story, so we're going to take it from that perspective. At the very beginning of the book of Hosea, as you often find in the prophets, it starts, the Lord speaks to the prophet, but he doesn't come with a proclamation for the entire nation or the entire world. He comes with a proclamation just for him. Hosea is told, by God, I want you to get married. Well, that's not a bad start, eh? Except God's real message to him, the whole thing is, Hosea, I want you to go out, I want you to find the worst wife you can find. I want you to horrify your parents with your choice. Something along those lines. I want you to come along home with a girl who you know has already been very unfaithful and is going to continue to be. I want you to make a terrible marriage choice. And you can just hear Hosea crying out, uh, why? Why would you do this, God? And God's remarkable response, and this is why this seems like a really weird story, it's, it's so you can have a really horrible, dysfunctional family. Is that something some God usually commands? the stage of life where I've got kids getting married, and I'm glad they didn't get this advice. <laughs> he goes out and he finds a young lady by the name of Goma. I don't know entirely her background, but soon afterwards, she becomes pregnant. And you can just imagine, one night, they're, they're sitting around the campfire, and, and as a pregnant young mom would be doing, starts to come up with some names for the kids. You can just imagine the conversation. And she starts off, you know, what do you think of the name? And her husband cuts her off. God's already given me the name for this child. And she think at that moment she might feel a little ripped off that she loses one of the great joys of motherhood. But she listens, and the name that's given is Jezreel. And that is a site of defeat in Israel's past. It's kind of like, maybe for Canadians, the best we come up with is, is God says, name this child Dieppe, the site of the, the battle in World War II in which so many Canadians lost their lives and were captured. And your first thought might be, well, as a memorial? And the, the answer is no. This is to remind you, you are a defeated people. Every time somebody looks at this child, they should see defeat. Oh. 
You don't feel so good about this, I don't think, as a mom. Well, my boy is born. A little later on, we're not given a lot of the story, but a little later on, she becomes pregnant again. Once again, they're sitting around the campfire, and she says, do I get to name this one? And Hosea looks at her, nope. I've got a good name. Name right from God. You are going to name the next child, or we're going to name the next child, not loved. Not loved. What do you think that does to a child, getting a name like that? Was born, she gets the name not loved. And it is so that every time the people look at her, they are reminded that God does not owe them love. God does not owe them anything. People who are smugly thinking that God owes them love are given judgment instead. What an overwhelming name. She becomes pregnant a third time. Once again, can just imagine to sitting around the campfire night <coughs> and her looking at her husband saying, so what are you going to throw at me this time? And I imagine by this stage, he just kind of sighs and says, this one's going to be named Not My People. Oh, She ends up leaving him. Now I gotta say, I actually don't know that I blame her at this stage. Be told to name all your kids these things. Well, anyway, she ends up leaving. And we go through this story, and at this stage, this really feels unfair. But it is a story to mirror how God feels when he gives a people an overwhelming blessing when he gives a people great love and it is met with apathy it is met by people who should have known better just a blase feeling that word apathy it is uh, originally a Greek word that was invented by the, the, the people who came a little bit later than our story here in ancient Greece to kind of describe how the Greek gods, how they saw the Greek gods, and how they looked at people. That the gods were apathetic to them. Well, here we have the reversed. God's not apathetic. But the people are. We have a God who is completely the opposite. We have a God who cares so deeply for people. A God who has such a depth of emotion. A God who has such a depth of care and love. That when we respond to him a certain way, we respond to him not just uncaring, not just in anger or as an enemy, but even just with apathy. We have a God of such a depth of love that it hurts him. We have a God who is remarkable, who is not apathetic to us. And this story is specifically for those who are the people of God, not just the nations out there. Story to, this is story to get the churches attention. That we need to see our relationship with God a certain way. They are religious folks who have grieved God. This is a message for the people of the church. And I want to real quickly hit a couple of highlights from the book of Hosea. You go through this book in the second chapter, verse 5. He's talking about, about this, this young woman, Gomer, who's going after lovers because she no longer fits in with her husband. 
and he compares it to people who do not find their satisfaction in a God who loves them. A couple of verses later in verse 8, points out that they are a people who are focused on what is wrong rather than the gifts that God has given them. Later in chapter 2, he's going to end their, their religious duties that they find so important. Because what's more important than their duties is faithfulness. Look over to chapter 4. He says, you act holy, but you do not act in love, faithfulness, and acknowledging the good that God has given you. Later in chapter 4, he says, don't accuse everybody else of being the problem. See yourself as a problem in the nation, because every one of us stumbles and falls. He goes on to say, you reject the law of God. And the people want to stand up and yell, hold on a moment, I'm faithful, I'm good. And he points out, you follow the laws that you find easy to follow. And there are some laws you ignore because you find them hard. Chapter 5, he says, you treat me like a moth. If you've got a moth flying around the house, they can be a nuisance, right? An annoyance. You're really treating me kind of like an annoyance. Chapter 6, he says, you're really good at sacrifice, but you're not so good at showing people mercy. Chapter 7, he says, I remember every sin, every failing. I don't miss them. And he goes on to say, it's kind of like in your life, you, you mix together all the ingredients of a cake. You've taken things that are good and you put them in there, but you've also taken in things that I hate. You mix it all together. And chapter 8 says, you act so religious. You seem at times to be so spiritual, but what you really worship is wealth and power. As I go through this, so far, we've come to some really hard words, haven't we? Some really hard concepts. God's not holding back in this. There has been some real offense to him. He has been really hurt by people who should have known better. But I've just ignored them. I mean, they, 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 they do all the things that they're supposed to do. They go to church. They do the sacrifices that they're supposed to do. And where it's convenient, they, they, they follow the rules. But at other times, God looks down and says, you're putting on a show. I want something deeper here. I want a relationship. Your religious devotion means nothing without repentance, without humility, without love. You hold on to, to some, some basics. And you think that allows you to ignore the commands of mercy and humility. And God comes along and says, I want you to once again behold my grandeur, my majesty that exists at the same time as my love and my compassion and my forgiveness. I want you to come along and make me the real center of your life. Well, it's been unexpected so far, this whole command of this marriage. That is an example of what they are doing to God and the, the way that that relationship has been broken. But I've got some good news. There is a lot more of Hosea than what I've come to so far. Chapter 8. Now, I've gone through a bunch of verses real quick. I'll put these ones on the screen. How can I give you up? Oh, Ephraim. Ephraim is another way of saying the people of God. How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like 
Adma, how can I treat you like Zeboim? These are, are kind of the, the nations out there. We don't know their whole story. He says, how can I treat you like this? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. Boy, we need these words. He continues, I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy every being before God. And I find the next words fascinating. Why is this true? For I am God and not a man. I'm different. <clears throat> He's just finished talking about how the depth of emotion has hurt me. And yet he come along and say, my reaction will be different. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. As I go through these these words, it almost makes me think that God is trying to say, if, if you were in my shoes, you would have long ago come and just wiped everybody out. But I'm not you. I am God, and I can stand in mercy. Say chapter 3 is a very short chapter. I was, I was preparing this week. I was reading one book that called it the greatest chapter in the Bible. I'm not sure that's not exaggeration. But it is a remarkable chapter. Gomer has been unfaithful in this period of time in which she leaves Hosea. Basically, she becomes a prostitute. She has many lovers. She's in relationships with all sorts of people. <coughs> And things obviously go really wrong for her because we're told she's sold into slavery. Now, whether it's because she's run out of money or whether she's just angered the local authorities or whatever, uh, there's all sorts of rules in the Old Testament about slavery and about how this wasn't supposed to happen in certain ways and you're supposed to treat them well. But we already know, I mean, the whole point of Jose is they're not obeying the law. So she stands to be sold into slavery. And in those days, this is the ultimate humiliation. She would have been dragged out into that, that, that courtyard in the center of town and put on display, probably not wearing any clothes, in front of a whole bunch of men. Probably dirty, looking, distraught, crying, I have no doubt, as she's dragged out of the heart and put on auction that somebody can buy her and do whatever they want with her. She goes up in front of the crowd and the auction begins and Somebody makes some sort of insulting opening offer, I'm sure, you know, one piece of silver. And, and some of the cries from the crowd start to ring out because they're trying to drive the price down, calling out that she's ugly. She doesn't look very useful. Things to try and drive down the crowd, but then Perhaps the bidding really starts and somebody throws out an honest bid of, I'll, I'll pay five pieces of silver for it. And, and Gomer hears the bid comes out, is in tears, not really paying attention to who's giving the bid, but the voice sounds disgusting, like, almost like it's not just finding this woman for the fields to work out the bar, but to be hoping lustfully to use her. And then she hears a strong, clear voice of ten pieces of silver. 
soul. And she thinks that is a familiar voice. And she looks out amongst her tears and sees her husband calling out. And a cry of ten pieces of silver is a serious bid, a very serious bid. And it starts a little bit of a bidding war. Eleven pieces, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, finally gets up to fifteen. All sorts of people have dropped out of the bidding. And somebody finally calls out saying, well, I have 15 pieces of silver. That's all I've got, but I, I want to buy this woman's soul. I will throw in a bushel of barley. And people gasp at the price that is being called out for this woman. And then much to everybody's shock, this husband, Jose, calls out, I will pay 15 pieces of silver and a bushel and a half. And that stops the bidding at this outrageous price. And everybody knows, probably, what is going on. Jose is buying her, buying his wife for the sake of vengeance. What a huge price to pay just for vengeance. I mean, she's been unfaithful, has deserted him. He now has the absolute power of revenge. But what the crowd doesn't know is God has already spoken. And the Lord said to me, so is they speaking, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an, and is an adulteress even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. You are to love her. He has the power of revenge, but that's not the message God wants. The chapter before this, God said that speak tenderly. I will speak in a way to pull everyone who is unfaithful back to me. We find as we go through chapter 2 that, that God offers us not just a master servant relationship, but he offers us a love relationship. He even says, I will take away their temptation, their, their bales, which was the other god that sometimes they worshipped. I'm going to take them away. You go on to chapter 6, he says, he will heal those of us who sin, those of us who struggle. Go through all of chapter 7. It's a whole chapter about how sometimes he has to expose sin in our lives so that we can be restored. Sometimes we need to go to the hard places to be made right. In chapter 12, he says, you will have no Savior except me. Chapter 13, he says, I will pay any price. I will ransom you. We tend to put ourselves we tend to put our concerns, our preferences, at the forefront of our lives to make it the center of everything. And this is truly a call. You go through Jose, it is a call. Let's make Jesus the center of it all. Let's put Jesus Christ in the middle of our lives. It is a remarkable story. It is so easy to get caught up in life and walk away from the glory, from living in the glory of a Savior, forgetting how much God has done for us, of, of, of continuing to, to look Christian, kind of be able to talk in such a way that we, we sound Christian, 
And yet, we stare at the problems of life. We stare at the temptations. We stare at everything else. Except Jesus. We need to be overwhelmed once again. I, I tend to read a little bit of the, the Gospel of Luke earlier, in Luke 7, in which it, it tells the story of, of two people who come looking for forgiveness for debts. And it says, who's going to be more happy the one who gets forgiven a law than the one who just has a mind of debt? And it's easy to look at that story and say, well, the moral of the story is we should sin a whole lot more so that God has more to forgive. That's not the point at all. The point of this story is there's some people, and in, in Jesus' case it's the Pharisees, who are going around convinced they don't really have a lot of sin to worry about. They haven't done much. They're not as bad as somebody else out there. And as a result, they kind of miss the glory of God. But the one who gets forgiven a lot is the one who recognizes, isn't it remarkable that God can love me? That God can be so invested in my life that he would send Jesus? Isn't it remarkable that God would forgive all the things in my life? Isn't it incredible how much God is doing in my life and making that a focus? Understanding how much needs to be forgiven There's a people. This is the point of this passage in Luke 7, and probably was it. There are people who saw themselves okay. Yeah, I've messed up here and there, but I'm a minor sinner. There are ones out there who are really bad, and it's not me. But there's others of us. Maybe I should put myself in this category because I'm still one. Others who need to, who do understand how much God has done to love them. Towards the end of the book of Hosea, chapter 12, there's a passage that begins like this. Take with you words. Come with a confession. Understand that again you need to confess your need for God. And return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity, except that is good. That needs to be the heartbeat. God's goal in all this is not to tear apart our self-esteem or something like that, or, or make us just feel bad about the wrong things we've done. He doesn't even want sin to be our focus at all. Our goal is to understand how much he has paid and how much he loves, and to do that, we need to keep coming back. Yeah, I mess up, but I've got a great God. I've got a remarkable God, and I sit in the glory of that remarkable God. God. We need at times just to turn off the world, to turn off everything else, and humbly come before God, confessing our absolute need for Jesus. Acknowledging again the price that he has paid to see ourselves less and less, and to see God So as we come to the conclusion, you may need today to spend a few moments in the quiet frame. So many distractions out there from his good Lord. Maybe today, once again, we need to stay and say, God, I have not made you the center. Forgive me. Refocus my heart in the same way you came to, to Hosea's generation and promise to take away your sin.
say, don't leave unless you've got your heart focused. Not on self. Not focused on circumstances of life. Not on this world. But knowing that while I am prone to sin, it doesn't have to consume me. But refocus my heart because I humbly come to the one who pays the price, pays the incredible price that I may know not the vengeance of God, but I may know the love. Because in the end, Hosea is called. Now love this wife. Love these children in the same way. I love you. I invite our worship team to lead us. We're going to sing the Spirit song, which is basically a simple worship song to refocus our hearts.